some years ago, I had a situation in the project where we had to create some test flows. So it had been kind of testing cars, not code. So um, testing cars and ECUs. And the situation had been that we always needed a developer for creating every single and simple test case. So the idea had been we would need to have a kind of language that a test designer could use and an engineer with his kind of knowledge and use it for and writing the code and it could just be executed. And we don't need anyone in the middle to translate that to a programming code. This is one of the classical and important use cases for a DSL. So, and this session should give an insight in how to write DSLs, especially with the Groovy as a language. So, first of all, a question from my side. Who had ever used a DSL? I would say almost anyone. I'm sure that the people that don't raise their hand as well used them, but they didn't know. Um, the other thing is, whoever tried or did write a DSL? Well, some few. Great. So just to say one thing, I expect and hope that everyone here has a profound knowledge of Groovy in its basic language structures, stuff like that. Um, otherwise, um, ask me if you don't understand anything and I try to help you and anyone else. So one thing from me, my name is Alexander Klein, but everyone is calling me Sasha. Sasha is the Russian short version of Alexander. So everyone, including my parents, call me Sasha. So you're welcome to call me Sasha as well. So I'm branch manager of Codecentric in Stuttgart, in Germany. And I'm doing Java-based development for more than 20 years now and using Ruby for more than 10 years. And yeah, besides coding and programming, another topic that I really like is user experience and ergonomics. So and although my title is brand manager, I'm still in development and I love to code. So but basically, what are DSLs? DSLs is, is, is an abbreviation for domain-specific language. So apparently we have to do with, with something to do with a language. So and this is a programming language. Although it might look a little different, but it is in the end a programming language. But one that is targeting a specific problem area. So it's not a general purpose language like you know from Groovy, Java, Kotlin, whatever. Um, it is focusing directly on a specific problem and it's as well as trying to have the same level of, ex of abstraction of the problem. So it is not trying to do baby steps and small things. It's trying exactly the things you would need to solve your specific problem or problem area. And as well as trying to use a tongue or names and wordings um, related to the problem domain. So that an engineer or any business logic worker, whatever, a non-programmer, um, is using the same words what they use in their daily business and what, how they think and how they do have their documentation, stuff like that. So this is very important, so it's a very specialized language. Some exp examples. Who has ever used SQL? You use the DSL. It's a specific DSL for creating, editing, and querying rational databases. Um, and the same thing. And is a DSL for defining build process, uh, processes and later on running that. Or CSS. CSS is a DSL to specify the look and feel of a web page. So these are all DSLs as well. If you look to Groovy, we have 
a lot of DSLs we use. One of the examples, for example, Swim, Swing Builder, that is a DSL for defining user interfaces in a declarative ways. In this case, Swing, the Swing Graph Builder is for Java FX and so on. So these are all examples for DSLs, but you as well can categorize them a bit, little bit. Mostly in three categories. One of them, and this is focusing in this talk, uh, focusing in this talk are the internal DSLs. Internal because it's part and embedded in a general purpose language. So if we normally if we write an internal DSL, it is using the structures and the logic and um, syntax from the general purpose language to create the specific language. Um, but you still have the power of the general purpose language if you need it and if you allow it. So these are called internal DSLs. The externals are the ones that you have completely off your code. For example, AND is written in XML. And these XML has be, had to be parsed and interpreted. Uh, and this is completely external from the normal language. Um, and you don't have any additional features especially, for example, if you would like to have an if statement in AND. And there's another group. These are the non-textual DSLs, um, especially in times where we have some modeling tools or stuff like that. Or we have languages like Scratch um, for children and beginners to learn programming. This is, t is a non-textual DSL because it is more visual. Um, or MATLAB, for example, where you can design mathematic um, flows uh, with visual elements. So non-textual um, languages, uh, DSLs, are always external languages or external DSLs. But why do we want to use DSLs? So normally, because they're more expressive and concise in its syntax. Because it's focusing on the domain problem area. And as well, it can increase the readability for some structures and some code. And uh, that because it's just getting to a higher level of, ex of extraction. For example, if you have an SQL select, and you don't have to think about opening the database connection and getting it and filtering and stuff like that. So you just focus on what you want. As well, it simplifies development um, with teams with different skill levels. For example, if you have juniors and seniors and mediocres and um, they come from different fields and areas, um, some of the guys could do the complex or some complex part and border it or hide it behind a DSL and the other one can have just to use the DSL and use the, the, uh, the syntax of DSL so it's easier for them and faster to step up. And from my point of view, the biggest advantage is that you can integrate non-developers into development. Um, and this is the most important um, key feature where a lot of DSLs will be created, but it's not the only one. So, how do we create some DSLs? And now we focus just on Groovy. In other languages, we have different. And we focus on internal DSLs. External DSLs would be another talk, uh, very different, uh, much about compiler theories and stuff like that. So, if we focus on internal DSLs, we as well can see we have three different scopes. Um, readable scope level, one of them is the command level. So it is a DSL that is more like a fluent API, for example. So if you want to use the Java builder pattern, you can do that with the add builder annotation very easily in Groovy, and then you can use this DSL where you just have, okay, create the builder, then the name, then the age, and then build it. This is domain-specific language because it's focused on the area how to create, in this case, a user interface or a user object. The next step or next level is uh, for the scopes is the clo closure scope. So everything that is inside of a closure here, like name is such a client and age is 43, this is DSL code 
that from the outside will be translated into a user object. So here we get a new user object. This closure just gets, in this example, gets the delegate, the user as a delegate, set in the resolve strategy to delegate first and then run the closure and then automatically all the values will land in the user. And I have my user completely filled. So the second step are the closures. And the third DSLs, what we normally would th think about, are uh, scripts. Scripts that you normally have in some external file, like this MyScript Groovy file, where we have name Sasha Klein and age 43. And here we say, OK, the base script of this script is a user base script. User base script is a file that I create. This is very easy in this case. Here I just have, OK, I have a user base script that extends script. This is important, otherwise it won't work. The compiler will tell you. Beside that, it's just delegating to a user object. But if we just create this class or load this class from the class loader, and then we say, hey, script run, then you will have exactly the effect you want to have. This is a very simple thing, but this is the third scope, the script level or script scope. Um, for the last thing, for the script base, we have other alternative way, another alternative way, if you don't want to have this build script annotation inside of your code, what you normally want to, um, then you have to tell the compiler that it should use the user script base as, a uh, user base script as the script base class. So then you can use this compiler configuration where you say, okay, my script base class is a user base script, and then give the class loader this configuration and then it's doing the stuff in the background automatically. Scripts as well have another feature. In closures, you have the delegate that you can set in scripts. You don't, you, know, you cannot set any delegate, but you're able to set a binding. And in the binding, this you can think, or it is actually a map in the background um, that is an additional variable container, I would say. And if you have an undefined variable, like here, no one said it necessarily set a type or def. So this is undefined, and I just say, OK, this my var is 100. Then it's automatically set to, a, uh, to this binding. And later on, I as well can use this variable from the binding, and it works fine. And you can use this mechanism as well to put values and methods inside the context of the script. So from the calling side, you can just add, for example, my war with, five, with 50 and my func, where you just put a closure in there. Um, just put it into the binding, then call, the, call it as usual. Then inside, you can use my func closure as a method, and, or like methods, and the my war as variables. So this is just part of your DSL. So this way you can prepare additional information or give additional information to your script to use, for users. Another very, very, very helpful and sometimes misleading thing is the command chaining. If we write, uh, if we write a code like turn left, then right, then this is syntactically valid groovy code. Why? Because the parser reads it this way. It's reading, call the method turn, give the, right, uh, the left as argument, and from on this result, call the then method and give the right as argument. So if you want to make that work as you like to, you just have to create something, a turn method that returns something that has a then method and so on. So, other things like that, for example, take two pills uh, of aspirin after six hours is a little bit like that. But this, although it is a code that is really valid groovy code, um, this is something a non-technical user as well can very easily use. And as well, you can use all the other language features like maps with 
colons and stuff like, stuff like that. Or closures that will be read like that. So let's make one example. We have the please show the square root of 100. What do we have to do? First of all, this is the way the compiler reads it. Reads it. So we have two top level things, or, or three. One of them is the show argument. The show is the action that we want to do. And in this case, for a showcase, it's just printing a value. And the next thing is the square root. How to um, how to calculate a square root is very easy with the math square root function and you put it in the closure because it, we don't know what to calculate late so we will get that later on so we'll do that in a closure so and then we just have to link it link it in the please method please is our, please is our starter yeah, there we set the show here we add the action closure and the result that we return in this case is a object I just created on the fly, so it's just an overwritten object class with one method, the, and it's called the. And the as well gets a closure. This is what we have in the next step. So the please returns an object that has a the method. So we can call the the the, the method. I should have taken another word. Um, so, and this as well gets another action, a calculation action. So, what to do? And the what closure here, just for a different approach, here I don't want to return an object, I simply return a map, because you can use it with maps as well. It's just easier to use. So, I return a map with off, and off is a closure that gets the value where you have want to calculate the square root from, so I just say, okay, do the action with the result from my calculation with the value that I just got. And then I got my 10 as, an, as a result. So you see, you can write very fluent um, things, very fluent sentences, very natural sentences. You just have, by creating that, have to think a little bit around the corners. Another use case for using command chaining is that you might beautify other code. For example, a juice has a splitter class, that's very helpful in some ways, where you can say, okay, split a string on commas and trim the result by underscores and give me back the result as a list. So it would be sweeter to do it this way. Split my string on comma, string by underscore. How to do that? It's the same way with what we just did. We just say, okay, I return a map that has an on, so the split returns something that has an on, and that returns something that has trimming and all have all the values, and then I can just use it. This is exactly the, thing, the same code than up here. Um, sometimes you want to collect a map or mapped all values or key and value pairs in a map of something that happened. For example, here in my script, name should be Sasha, age 33, and so on, like in a configuration script or something like that. So how I can do that is very easy. I just have a base class that has a map as a backup, and I define a method missing. The method missing is a method that will be called from Groovy if a method is called that does not exist. So, and in this case, if this method does not exist, the name method and the my property method, it's just putting the key and the value into this map then I have all my stuff in there. So this is a very easy and simple way to put everything, and I don't know how the keys are named, but everything in this map and I can use it later on. If I would have to the need to intercept every method call, then I could use it with the, or use the invoke method, method or overwrite that. 
Um, but be aware that if you do that, then the method missing will not be automatically called because the call of method, mi method missing um, is part of the default implementation of invoke method. Uh, the same thing works with properties. There we have the property missing, or two property missing, one for getting and one for setting, uh, other way around. Two arguments for setting, one argument for getting a property. Um, and the corresponding methods is get property and set property that you could override if you want to do the same thing here. And here as well, property missing is called from these getters, a get property and set property. Um, so far so good, but sometimes we have the situation that we have, yeah, we have to change things that we don't have at hand. For example, if we want something like six pills, then we would have to add a method get pills to an integer. Because six is an integer. Uh, but integer is final and it's not in our hand, we don't have the source code and so on. But we could use the, meta, uh, the runtime or other features, dynamic features from Groovy. And the base for that is that all classes have a meta class. A meta class is more um, abstract class on top of that, and it's handling all access to properties and methods, dynamic and statics. And although you could write at the moment your own um, meta class, it will change in Groovy 3, so um, I, I wouldn't recommend it. So normally is what you do is you change existing meta classes, like in this case I add a method get pills to the meta class of integer. And this method is a closure. A closure. This closure doesn't get an argument, but if you want to get hold of the integer where you have, you can access it by delicate gate. So in this case, okay, three get pills or three dot pills would be um, a list of three pills in this case. And the same works with proper adding properties the same way because a property is a getter and a setter and somewhere to hold a variable or the value. So where to hold the value, best is to put it into a, a synchronized map, for example, and then add the getter and add the setter and just get the values from, from the synchronized map. Then you have that finished. So this is an easy way where you can add th some things at runtime to, the, uh, to classes. And then you can use the other forms in your DSL. Another feature that is very helpful and sometimes important is the ov operator overloading. If we have a DSL order ice cream and sun cream when the temperature is above 20 degrees or 20, then the compiler reads like that. And here you see ice cream and sun cream is an operator action. And we could implement it this way. So the sun cream here is just a string, ice cream as well, and the temperature is 30 degrees, for example. And we have to add the AND method to the meta class of string, because each method, uh, each operator has a corresponding method for the left operand, um, and if you override that, you can change the behavior that way. So I add the AND method to the string, where it's just concatenating it with an AND, a literal AND. So and then I can say, OK, order what? And when the condition, and so I can just print out of what I need. Here, just for reference, for example, if you look, uh, want to look up later on here, you have a list of all the operators with the corresponding methods for operator overloading. What we just did is modifying the meta class at runtime. But if you want to do that at compile time, or something similar, uh, you as well, or in a different way, you can use the extension modules. 
If you use any of the methods that Groovy is adding to the language, to the normal Java classes, um, you're already using extension modules, the default extension modules that Groovy brings along. But you can very easily write your own ones. So for example, write a class, a normal POJO, with a static method, in this case low, um, where it's just putting the uh, string to lowercase. So very easy to implement because this is very normal static code, what you have. If you have that, additionally you just have to create a simple file and put it into the class path along with the, with the class. And it is called org.coco's uh, groovy runtime extension module. So this is the file name. And it resides in meta -inf services. I just have the module name and the module version and the classes as a comma separated list for the extension classes if you have multiples. And as soon as you have that in compile time, every compilation run will have access to the low method on strings. And if you have more complex or other uses, use cases, you can use AC transformations. AST transformations or what, what is an AST tree? AST tree is an abstract syntax tree. So it is, if you compile a language, um, the tokenizer will tokenize the, uh, this, the words and then they will be put together into a concrete syntax tree that is really the, um, forms the structure of the code. And this will be abstracted to the abstract syntax tree as part of in the compilation phases. Um, and from this on, this AST can be modified with AST transformations. For example, if you use the add delegate somewhere, this is an AST transformation. And this is for modifying the AST at compile time. So adding, deleting, mod adding new classes, changing classes, whatever. And we have two types. One of them is our local AST transformations that are triggered by annotations. For example, the add lock, what you might have used in the past, or add lock for J. Or you have global AST transformations that are always active as soon as they are registered. And with AST transformations, you can do, I would say, almost everything. There are some limitations, but almost everything can be handled and done. Um, you as well can change uh, the result of your your script completely. So in the past I already changed a normal DSL in a um, state machine based DSL or runtime. Um, just without changing the code, just changing the AST, uh, adding an AST transformation. So, and these changes got melted rightly, right directly into the bytecode. So after that, uh, they are in there like if you had a, would have written it manually and it can be used from everywhere, from Java and your IDE, you can use everything. So you as well have the best IDE support if you use AST transformations. For local AST transformations, yeah, you have to define an annotation and had to be annot this annotation had to be annotated with Groovy AST transformation class that targets to the implementation of the AST transformation. So this is the my transformation. This as well had to be annotated with Groovy AST transformation. And it has just a single method, the wizard method that comes from the AST transformation interface. And this will be called for every node um, in, the, in the compilation. And you can use that very easy with the add and then your name of your annotation, add the annotation to, for example, a method if it has a target method type or variable if it's variable type uh, and so on. The AST nodes method, uh, parameter, contains the um, two things. One of them is the annotation, the my annotation, because it could have some parameters, for example. And it contains the second argument, is it contains the annotated node. So in this case, the method node do it. And then you can change it. And in the source unit, you have the whole AST. So if you have different things you want to change beside that location, you can do that over the source unit. 
And for global AST transformation, they are very similar, but the AST nodes parameter is null because there is no annotation, and no annotated node, and um, they have to be part of the um, have to be part of the class path, and they have to be registered in these global AST transformations. And this is as well done with the file or a code house groov groovy transform AST transformation just a list of the classes that should be added or used at AST transformations. And as soon as this is in the class path, it will be used for every compilation. From now on, where we have Groovy 2.5 running, we have the macro feature that simplifies writing AST transformation a lot. Um, it's much smoother to use it, to do it. Now to the part of using DSLs. So how do I embed some DSLs? Um, multiple possibilities. One of them is implementing it or using the Groovy shell. And I just say, OK, create a new Groovy shell, add the binding, like the scripts, and then evaluate and either a string or a file or input stream or whatever, whatever you want to have. And later on, you as well can access the binding. Maybe the script writes something into the binding, then you can get it out from there. Um, you as well can use compiler configurations. You just give it as another argument. Um, and another thing is you could use um, the Groovy class loader to load the class. Not the Groovy shell, but the Groovy class loader. Here you just pass the class from the, uh, from the, yeah, the source code and will be compiled automatically. You as well can use compilation configuration if you want to, if you have some information. Um, and that's, yeah, as well very concise and easy. Depends on what you have and what it looks like. And the third way is you have the Groovy script engine. Groovy script engine has the advantage that you can define multiple paths where your scripts reside, and the script engine just looks where do I find this file, and I don't, I just call it by the name of a file, and I don't have to specify the location. Um, here as well, I can use compiler configuration, and uh, as with the other ways as well, and as we had so much about compiler configurations, have a look to that. So, first of all, what we already did, you can set the script base class. But that's not everything. You as well can add some AST transformation customizers. That means you can add a local AST transformation to the, to the script. It's like writing or like adding these AST transformation to the script, in this case, for example, the add lock. And as soon as you do that, you have internal all the features of the log annotation, so you have a log variable that you can use for writing your logs. Um, you as well can add your own customized um, imports. For example, if you have a special package that you would use inside of your script and you don't want the user to use the import statement, then you can tell the compi compiler configuration, uh, add the import my package, my class, so this is a specific class, or as well can add a star import, like the whole package Java time, and then add it and use it. Or you can get a little more fancy and add things only under, under special conditions. So in this case, with the source aware customizer, you can say only add the import customizer, this one, if this validator returns true. And this kind, this is an extension validator, so it gets the extension of the script, and this is, and only do that if the extension is DSL. You as well can do that with, uh, but, but there are other validators as well, so you can be very complex in what you think. For example, you could look, if there is a special keyword in my DSL file, then do this or do that, use that. And to simplify um, all this stuff, oh, I think I, ah, what I forgot is that um, with the secure AST customizer, I as well can say, um, you can restrict what the, what the DSL user 
can use. For example, you can prohibit statements where the statement blacklists, switch statement and third statement, for example, these statements are not allowed in your DSL. So you can remove or prohibit features of the Groovy language from your DSL. Or you can disallow the creation of methods all along. You can do that with closures as well, and there are a lot more you can configure in here. So you can uh, restrict almost every feature and every statement and expression in Groovy. Uh, and you even can create your custom ones. With the variable expression or with, the, with these expression checkers here, I just check that variables starting with underscore and dollars are not allowed for whatever reason. But in this case, if you have a variable with underscore in your DSL script, then the compilation fails on a given compilation error. So and to simplify that, we as well have a DSL for creating these customizer uh, compiler customizations. And um, so this is a DSL, it's the compiler customization builder where we can do all the other things that we just did programmatically. Here, adding AST transformations or imports and secure AST checkers and stuff like that. Um, you as well can externalize your compiler configuration into a script somewhere, and you can just add it with minus minus um, config script to your Groovy compiler for the compilation, or if you're using Gradle, for example, you as well can do it with this line of code where you can um, just specify the file. So you can use it. Um, so based on that, I have some best practices from my experience what's helpful sometimes, and one of the things what to think about is how should we design a DSL? First of all, best is it's minimalistic. So only expose the features that and the behavior, behavior that you really need. Because everything that is exposed will be used by the users as soon as they can get hold of the knowledge of it. So, um, Everything that had been exposed, you have to be aware that it's very easy to get rid of that later on. The other thing is, it should be distilled, so remove all non-essential details. So, because this is a special language for just a single purpose, um, don't try to make a different general purpose language with just different words. Um, so just focus on the solution of your problem, and if you have other problems, maybe make another language or enhance it that this DSL uh, solves these two problems, but not a general solution stuff. And make it possible that you extend it, or you can extend it and extend it in a way that you have minimal impact on the users. So, um, if you add new features and change features, be aware that uh, the users are not really pleased if they have to change their, their already used implementations. Especially if you're working with non-technical folks, um, I would say the acceptance is very low in this case. Another thing, do some syntax checking. Although this is really hard to do, but it's really worth it. And your users will value it. Not openly, but they will tell you, or make you a lot of work by taking the telephone and calling you, oh, something is going on, I don't understand. So one way to check the syntax is to use the expression checker. So I already showed you. These are very mighty and you can do a lot of things, um, but sometimes it's very tedious and complex to use that. So it's best to just use that for the complex things or the special things and not for the easier ones. And for the easier ones, very often it's best to use a type checked or compile static. If you use 
type checked on compile static, you will lose most of the dynamic features. Um, but there are ways where you can tell a lot of things for the compiler, the Groovy compiler, that then will work again. And so you have to help the compiler. So one of these, or the way to help them, it is the add delegates to annotation. For example, if we have this small DSL where you can define an email you know, with a from and to and subject and a body. So here we have an email specification object in the background that we have as a script base class um, where we just do something. Implementation here is not important, but you see you have the corresponding methods. So usage of that would be, okay, I have an email uh, method, and then it gets a closure, and this closure gets the emails back as, um, as a delegate here. Code delegate is the email, and the resource strategy is the delegate only, so it's only using this from this delegate, not the other stuff, um, before that it's cloned, and then the method, uh, the closure is called. The problem is, um, that at, with add type checked, this compilation will fail. Because the compiler does not know that inside of email it is valid that you have a from and a to and a subject. Because it does not know the, um, the delegate. So you have to tell the compiler what the delegate is. And therefore, we have the delegates to annotation. So if you annotate your pr the closure with delegates to email spec, then suddenly the compiler knows, oh, this is um, the, um, the backing object, and then it can really check it. And then my compilation works. And even I can even give the um, resolve strategy, because here I have uh, the delegate only that is a little bit different with um, delegate first or owner first. So you can give that as well as an argument. And then it works. There are some cases where you want to delegate to a parameter. For example, if we have this use case, you have a exec method where you get a target and a closure. And the closure, the content of the closure should, or the delegate of the closure, I would say, should be this target. So at the time where you write your code, you will not know uh, where you have to delegate because you will get it at runtime into the object uh, object parameter. So for example, if I have a greeter class, I can say, or I have a greeter, I can say exec the greeter, then say hello is valid because greeter has a valid method. But your compiler doesn't know that yet. So you have to tell him. And therefore we have a accompanying annotation, the delegates to target, where I can say, okay, delegates to target is my object, and the delegate delegates to doesn't have any class here, because if it doesn't have a class, it looks for it, um, delegates to target. And this is all you have to do, and then this as well compiles finally. And if you have the situation that you want to delegate to a generic type, you have another situation. So here, for example, this delegates to this type here, this generic type of this list. Um, for that, here, you can just say, OK, this delegates to this element. And in the delegates, a delegate to target to the elements, and delegates has here the generic type index zero. You cannot add the classes because of the type erasure of and other restrictions of the generic type system in Java or JVM, uh, but with the index of the generic types, then this works as well. And if you have more complex things, for the type checker. You can write your own type checker ex um, extension. This is not really complicated, but it's too much for the talk here. 
Um, there's a really nice block series, um, or and as well there is uh, the documentation that is very readable. So this is something you have to do, or can do. Another thing besides the syntax checking, what is really helpful and important sometimes is that you have some execution control, especially with scripts. Because, for example, if you have a never-ending loop in your code, because one of your um, DSL users just added it in there, um, your whole project or this thread will run forever and will not return, because threads are not allowed to be killed. They can just be interrupted. Um, interrupted to kill themselves or to finish themselves. But the DSL writer or the code writer has to implement checks if it is interrupted. And therefore we have the thread interrupt AST transformation that adds such interruption checks at special locations. At the end or after any loop or in any loop and after the first instruction of a method and the first instruction of a closure body. Um, this is what it just does automatically and from this time on it's much more likely that you can interrupt your, your thread. But sometimes you want to interrupt after a given time. If you want to have a maximum script running phase or a timeout. This you can do with the, time, uh, the timed interrupt, where you can say when it should auto interrupt automatically. And the third one is a conditional interrupt if you have a special self-coded um, condition when the script should be ended. For example, if any external variable is set or something else. Yeah? So you can just give it a closure and if it returns true then it will interrupt the thread. Another thing that you have to handle with is dependency management. Normally you don't want the DSL user to add some external libraries and stuff to use. Um, but as the Grape, the Groovy Adaptable Packaging Engine, what we have for dependency management is just an AST transformation. You can just add it with the AST transformation customizer to the, com um, to the compile customizer. Compiler customizers. And yeah, one of the next important things is error handling. Um, give some detailed information to your users, and you do not only make pleasure to him, but to yourself as well, because they will not stand in your office so often. So give it a clear message what happened something that we should do with every exception we throw. But as well, try to giving the file name and the line where it happened. Because not every user is able to read a stack trace correctly. Um, so what sometimes help is, helps is just when you get the exception, you can get hold of the stack trace. And in most cases, it's just enough to search for the first entry in the stack trace um, that is not org code host Groovy, Groovy or Java. And then you normally you have your script and then you can get hold of the line number and the file name of your script of this element. So this is a small snippet that very often helps in general exception handling um, to give more information like the file number and the line number, um, yeah, file name and line number. And another thing that is really important and helpful is IDE support. And this is a really big topic and a very important topic. Um, I suggest, really suggest, to use IntelliJ IDEA instead of Eclipse um, because it has a lot more power, especially with IDE support. So I just go into that here, but first of all, use delegates to wherever you can. And if you don't think you can, then think about if you really cannot. So this is one thing, delegates to is very important for DSLs. The next thing is um, add the 
the annotation at base script, the problem is um, if you have the base script in the compiler configuration, the DSL does not know it. So, but if you add it at the um, user base script or the base script annotation into the script, then IDE knows it and supports it. From this time on, you as well have um, code completion in this script. And sometimes uh, really add this line of code or the annotation with the base class, uh, base script, even if I have it in the compilation customizer just for the IDE that, it w um, that will support code completion. And if you don't want that, or if you have more complicated uh, and complex things you want to do, then IDEA gives the GDSL, it's the Groovy DSL script. And this is a DSL to define your DSL. So to give IDEA information how it works, and there's a really good, um, really good blog post from To The New that I would say it's really worth um, to read and you can use that. So then I hope that the next time when we had the situation that we had to write a DSL or want to write a DSL, I gave you a little bit of instruments and toolkit to start looking into this topic. It's really fun to do. It's very powerful. Sometimes it's killing all your nerves, but that's normal in development. So I thank you very much, and maybe we have time for some questions. So either I had been glass clear, or I blew your mind very soon. <laughs> Yeah, if you get any questions later on, I will be here for the whole conference. And thanks a lot, and have a very great, great conference.